No mobile phones. No Twitter. No internet. And email. And text messages. Imagine such a world. Well, believe it or not, not many years ago, that was our world. And a few years ago, not many years ago, there was such a thing as a letter. And a letter was something that people used to write with a pen. And then they used to put it onto paper, like this. Put it onto a piece of paper, and then they would get their letter and however many pieces of paper, and then put it in an envelope. And then they would have to put a stamp on it, and then put it into the postbox. And the person who was to be the recipient would receive their letter with joy. Imagine a lover, someone very dear and near to you, and you haven't seen them. Circumstances meant that you had to be parted. You haven't seen them for some number of months or even a year or And you get a letter from them. It's a six-page letter. What would you do with that letter? You might say, well, this is so special to get a letter from them. Haven't had one in such a long time for whatever reason. You might make yourself a cup of tea or whatever. You'd certainly maybe sit yourself down in a chair. You might be so excited you just want to whip it up and read it there and then. You'd sit yourself down perhaps in a chair. And you'd make yourself ready. And you would sit and read the letter. Would you, after the first paragraph, put the letter down and say, that's fantastic. I'll come back and read some more tomorrow. Would you read the first page and put it down and say, I'll read the rest tomorrow? Surely you wouldn't. Surely you would read it in one go. And if it was the time was uh, demanding other things of you, you would perhaps leave the whole thing until you had time to be able to focus exclusively on it. Maybe, having read it once, you might come to it again and read little bits, little gems, that funny little story on page two, the uh, dreadful incident on page three, well that's probably the wrong thing to say, the dreadful incident on page four, or the um, funny little story on page five. But you would read it more than one And yet when we come to the Bible, we come to, say, for example, the uh, book of Ephesians. Six chapters. Chapters are put in, as you know, not at the time of writing, but centuries afterwards. And yet what we tend to do in our reading of this and any of the uh, parts of the Scripture is maybe to read a passage. Some people only read one or two verses. Maybe they've got a, a daily notes to go with it or something like that. But often many of us just read it in a chapter at a time. Now, if you read Ephesians in that way, and I'm not saying that's wrong, because I think that's um, a, 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 sometimes a good thing to do, so you can study it in more detail. There isn't time to maybe study the whole book, because that would take quite a considerable amount of time. So we've got to study it chapter by chapter. But when you read a book like Ephesians, what you do, what you notice, is that the first three chapters, and indeed even part of chapter four, is what we would call doctrine. The rich truths of the Christian faith that Paul is laying down. There's not much by way of application, applying it to your personal life. But Paul actually has much application. He gives much application. And when you get to the latter part of the epistle, it's full of application. When it's preached, when someone is preaching from Ephesians, they don't just bring the doctrine in chapter 1, and in chapter 2, and in chapter 3, they would try to apply it, because that's the right way, isn't it? And if we read the whole of the letter, we get this glorious, rich truth, this doctrine, laid one upon another, and then as we come towards the latter part, then it's all applied. It's all applied. What we've seen in chapter 2, and again in chapter 3, is that the Jew and the Gentile in Christ are new creatures. What does that lead to? 
what is Paul leading to by, by telling us these things, that Jew and Gentile are now united as one in Christ, a new creation, new humanity in Christ. What is he aiming towards? And why do we have, in chapter 3, as we've seen, from verse 2 down to the end of verse 13, why do we have this, what you might call a parenthesis, a digression? He seems to have got at the end of chapter 2 to a point where he wants to launch into prayer, but then he steps back again and he starts talking about his own calling and his own um, ministry in teaching the very things he's been outlining in chapter 2. And of course he comes back to pray at the end of that digression. Why does he do that? Well, I've said before and I'll say again, one of the reasons is because he wants, when he comes to that prayer that's in verse 16 and on, in chapter 3, when he comes to that prayer, his aim is that the person reading it, or the person hearing it, not only will give a hearty Amen or Amen to what Paul is praying for them, but they'll make it their target, they'll make it their ambition, as it were, their own aim, to seek those things for themselves. But also, the fact the verse that we're looking at today, verse 12, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. In that verse, Paul, in a sense, is stating again, though with a bit more meat, something he's already stated. He's stated in chapter 2 of Ephesians and verse 18, through Christ, we both, Jew and Gentile, have access to the Father by one Spirit. Now in chapter 3, verse 12, he says, In Christ and through faith in Christ, we may approach God with freedom and with confidence. And what Paul wants to bring is, or reinforce, is this realisation that you don't need a priest you don't even need an apostle to pray for you. Good when people do pray for you, but you don't need that. You can approach God yourself. But then, the third thing I would suggest, the third reason why he uh, has this digression, why he states this again, what he said in chapter 2, verse 18, now says again in chapter 3, verse 12, a third reason would be because he's seeking to reinforce what he's said already. Because we're very, how about you, we're very dull-witted. I can be very dull-witted. You hear something once, you forget names is my big problem. I forget names so easily. And we learn something, we think we've learned something, but then we forget. Paul wants this to be second nature to us. And so he reminds us, he wants to reinforce it. The doctrine that he gives in these chapters is not there just to make us so that we can spout off to people what we know about God. It's not just to try and make us clever. It is, has a practical purpose. The practical purpose is to aid us in our daily living. If we just had uh, chapter 4 and to the end of the epistle, just the application, well, there's, there's a sense in which that might do us good, but we don't know why we're doing these things. We don't know why we're being told this is the way to live. And if we just had the doctrine, and we just become heirs, filled with all sorts of knowledge, but it doesn't do us any good. The practical purpose of the doctrine is to be applied to our daily living. So, for example, if we understand, as when Eva uh, was, was praying on Thursday, how she loves that word omnipotent, omnipresence, omnibenevolence. In other words, God is all-powerful. God is present everywhere, all presence. God is all loving. Omniscience. God is all knowing. Now as I understand these things, and I apply them to my life, I'm facing my difficulties, what do I say? I say, well, if God is omnipresent, if God is omniscient, if God is omnipotent, and yet I've got these problems, well, hang on a minute, if God is for me, who can be against me? Who can be against me? Therefore, with God on my side, 
but I can face all things. So I apply what I know, I apply it to my life. And so what Paul is seeking to do is to bring this doctrine. All this doctrine is not just to give us head knowledge. It's leading to a marvellous, glorious conclusion. There's a sense in which he re reached it in verse 18 of chapter 2, but then he's come back, reinforced it, now he's coming back to it again in chapter 3 and verse 12. A glorious conclusion. And so we might ask, what is that conclusion? What is the conclusion? We're going to turn the verse on its head and start with the letter. The conclusion is this that we may approach God with freedom and confidence. That's the conclusion of what Paul has been speaking about in chapter 2 and chapter 3. If it's just doctrine on its own, it doesn't mean anything. But it leads to something. And it leads to this marvellous conclusion that you and I, we may approach God with freedom and with Confidence. So let's look at those words. Let's look first of all at this word approach. We may approach God. It actually means access. Access. Having the right of approach. In fact, it's the very same word that was used and given that rendering in verse 18 of chapter 2. Access. Here, they put it in a different way in the NIV, but it's the same Greek word, access. The right to be able to approach, a right of approach. If you ever watch the news and there's something um, political happening, a political storm or whatever, you often find that uh, Nick Robinson or someone like that is standing opposite Downing Street, and you've got number 10 Downing Street there, and he's telling you about the, the, uh, the great storm that's been caused, a political nightmare that the Prime Minister is facing, or whatever it is. But behind him is the door to take down the street. There's a policeman standing there, probably not like that. There's a policeman standing there. But what often happens if the interview is long enough is that you'll see someone generally in a, a suit and tie uh, passing up very quickly up and down the street. Sometimes you might see them showing a pass. But what you see is the door opening. Then going in. And then you see the door open again, a different person coming out. They have this right of access. They can approach 10 Downing Street and they can go in. Now, can you do that? Can you go to 10 Downing Street? And can you go and knock on the door and just, or open it and say, Excuse me, uh, Bobby, I'm just going in to see my mate Dave? You wouldn't be allowed, would you? The reality is, you can't even go into the street. Blockaded at the entrance. You have to have a pass to get through. Now, in special circumstances, of course, you can go to 10 down the street. Not in a school party to visit and um, drop your um, got stoppers everywhere and all that. You can go get that one. But you can go if you've got some kind of special petition that you've been uh, organising. Maybe it's uh, save the badgers, don't gas them all, or whatever it might be. You can go with your petition, and because it's been pre-arranged, you can walk past that policeman that's where the blockade is at the start of Downing Street, and you can go up to the door, and you can maybe even knock on the door. And then someone will open it, and they'll take the petition off you. You won't get out inside, but you can go to the door on a special occasion. Well, when it comes to the Christian, when it comes to the Christian, and not now the Prime Minister, but Almighty God, the Christian has a right of entry. We have access. We can approach the Lord God Almighty. Sometimes when I deliver uh, a local magazine, you see different things, and some of you have helped with that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you see different things at different houses. There's often, you see on some houses, a nice mat. We've always tried to have a nice mat, but they don't stay nice for very long, so they've given up, I was thrown over the edge at the moment. They have a nice mat, 
and he's got welcome. He's welcome. Welcome. I've seen a placard on someone's house, and it says, All visitors bring pleasure to this house. Some by their entering, others by their leaving. <laughs> when it comes to Almighty God, there is, as it were, this glorious welcome act. And there isn't now someone standing there and saying, oh, no, no, not here. Quick, draw the curtains. The door is flung open wide. Right of access. You are welcome before him. Welcome. Not just now a minister goes to Ten Downing Street and he's allowed at 10 o'clock because that's when the cabinet meeting is or some other thing is being discussed. He has to have an appointment in a sense. We can go anytime, anytime into his presence. Paul, who's written at the start of chapter 3 that he's a prisoner. Paul is a prisoner, yet he is content. How is he content? He's content because he has this access, this access to his Father in heaven. He may approach him, and he does approach him. He approaches him. And I would suggest to you that he approaches him an awful lot. When I worked on a helpline, a Christian helpline, there was a time when the phone number of the person calling would show up, and we got to know who the regular callers were. And there were many regular callers. Some would ring several times a day, and some were not easy to talk to. And there was always a temptation when you saw a certain number come up to kind of pretend you were doing something else, very busy, so that some other person would answer that call. That's never the case. Never the case. When it came to call, Paul would be in and out of the Lord's presence. Pray continually, he said. And he did. And he was always welcome. And not only Paul, but you and I. We may approach him. And he bids us come. He invites us to come. Jesus himself said, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. <coughs> we may approach him. But then he goes on to say, secondly here, the second word, is freedom. We may approach God with freedom. And the word itself is literally boldness. And actually, in its use as a Greek word, it's used in the context of not just boldness being bold, but actually boldness in speaking. Boldness in speech. Turn to the end of Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 19. The word is used again there. And it's used in a, a kind of more, I don't want to say more correct con context, but it's used in a slightly different context. It's used as the word fearlessly, the NIV translates it. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, my mouth, words may be given to me so that I will fiercely, fiercely, Fearlessly, fearlessly, we did it sometimes. <laughs> fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Fearlessly. Freedom, boldness to speak. Freedom to speak. You know, sometimes your, your tongue is tied. Well, we watched um, Pride and Prejudice uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, the, the, uh, Mr. Darcy and Mr. Bingley, they both want to ask these two young ladies in their wagon. Both of them are a bit nervous about it, so they're rehearsing outside what they're going to say and all the rest of it. And uh, they didn't make a passion because they're nervous. They're nervous. They don't stride forward with boldness and confidence, even though they're wealthy men in the story. They're tongue tied. You ever been tongue tied? I remember um, at school going out with a girl, a particular girl who was considered uh, one of the sort of uh, I don't know, best known girls in the year. Everyone liked her and what have you, good looking and all the rest of it. And there was another boy who was considered one of the, the best boys in the year as well. And suddenly I was around this house where both of them were and I was going out with this girl who was one of the best girls in the year, with this boy who was one of the best boys in the year, as it were. And I sat there in silence. And the best boy said to me at one point, What's the matter, Dad? Cat got your tongue? I didn't know what to say. I felt like, oh, thank 
you know, throughout that pathetic uh, way of thinking. But Paul is saying here, we have this access to be bold in our speaking to God, to come to Him with this great freedom, and to come fearlessly, fearlessly, Fearlessness to speak before God. If you were to stand before a monarch, as I understand it, the rules of um, etiquette in our country mean that we are to be, you're to be like a little child before the Queen, before someone, a member of the royal family. You speak only if spoken to. And I know someone who broke that rule. He spoke out of turn. The member of the royal family was walking past, looking at them. And when he came to him, he stopped and looked him up and down. The person said to the member of the royal family, how do you do? He was so incensed. He was broken a rule to the tower with him. <laughs> off of his head. Well, perhaps not like that, but you're not supposed to do that before. It's not the way you do it. Ah, but when you come before God, you can speak boldly. You enter his presence and you speak boldly to him, who is your maker. Isn't that incredible? There are people in this world we're not supposed to speak to. There are people in this world we might fear to speak. But if you're a Christian, you can speak boldly to God. And He wants you to. He wants you to lay before Him your heart as it were. Isn't that glorious? The next word, we may approach Him with freedom and confidence. Confidence. Well, confidence is what it says on the tin. It's confidence. It's trust. Confidence and trust. That's what the word means. Now before, we had confidence and trust implied in this idea of approaching God. We've had it implied in this idea of the freedom that we make that we have to approach Him fearlessly. But now it's directly stated. Paul again, restating things. He's implied it in the first few words. Now he directly states it. Confidence. We can approach him with freedom and confidence. Again, I put it to you, the reason he restates these things is to really run it into us, to get it through to us. What we have with him, we can come with confidence. Now if you were to go before someone, I know I've already um, suggested this, but if you were to go before someone who's considered important in the world, and it's not your normal practice to go before a person who's considered important in the world, you might find that even though you're told you can speak freely to him, you can speak freely to him, speak your mind, you might find yourself a little bit hesitant to start, because you're not used to it. A bit like when you watch some of these um, like question time on the television, when uh, David Dimbleby says, anyone in the audience got an opinion here? And you found, foolishly, you've raised your hand to speak. And then he says, yes, uh, the, the, the chap in the uh, blue shirt there. <laughs> and suddenly, I have seen some people, and it's clear they've written down what they want to say, because they're kind of doing this, you know. And you always feel for the person who gets tongue tied. What I usually find in those kind of situations is, you have this like that, you're feeling uh, perhaps nervous about it. Once you start, it hopefully, <laughs> and usually, it gets easier. It gets easier. You hesitate at the start, but then you gain confidence. A bit like my best man at my wedding, who wanted to go before the speeches, said, I've got to go back to another wedding this evening where there's an evening reception. Do you mind if I go early? I won't, give a, I won't give a talk, I won't do anything like that. I'll just do a toast and I'll go early. He was nervous. He didn't want to do it. He saw the look on my face of disappointment and he thought, I've got to do this. And he turned to me about 15 minutes into his speech, when they were, they were delayed with the uh, sparkling uh, wine stuff. Um, he turned to me while they were giving that out and said, This is great. 
Very long for these are these. And you can see that what had happened. He had started off all nervous. But then when he realised that it wasn't as bad as all that, and he was getting a real rapport from the people. He was, but he couldn't shut him up in the end. There are all sorts of stories. <laughs> so what is this glorious conclusion that Paul is wanting to arrive at, and indeed he's arriving at, after chapter 2 and chapter 3? It's this, that we may approach God with freedom and with confidence. But then the second question to ask and this is where we flip the verse again, is how can we? How can we approach God? How can we approach God with freedom? How can we approach Him with confidence? How can we do such a thing? Well, there are those, of course, who say that anyone can approach God. All have this opportunity to be able to approach God. Everyone can come to Him. And there are many, in fact, I've read of statistics that say people have researched and said prayer is good for you. Prayer is good for you. It doesn't really matter if you understand who you're praying to. Prayer itself is good. It relieves tension. A bit like, you know, a, a burden shared is a burden half. Or a care shared is a care part. Burden shared is a burden part that do. Relieves tension. A bit like going to the gym. A bit like a teacher I knew who, if he had a stressful day, he would go for a run. Someone took a coin or a stone or something by line, and they scraped, as a child at school, scraped the line all down the side of his car. He was so mad, his new car. He didn't have done it. So mad, so mad. Quickly changed, and he went for a 10 mile run. It took 10 miles to get that tension away from you. Prayer is good for you. Some people say that's the best way to relieve tension. But here's a question. Here's a question. Should you encourage, should you encourage someone who doesn't believe in God or someone who isn't a Christian, should you encourage an unbeliever to pray to God? Should you encourage them to do it? Should you say, when they're presenting you with all their woes, should you say, have you tried prayer? Should you say that? Should you encourage them that the Lord will hear them in prayer? Not according to the Old Testament. Not according to the Old Testament. Go back to Mount Sinai. Go back to Israel. Having escaped, been brought out of slavery in Egypt, and they get to Mount Sinai, and they're at the foot of Mount Sinai. Who's allowed to go up Mount Sinai? It's only Moses. It's only Moses. Joshua, his assistant, yes, he goes with him as well. But it's only Moses. The people are not allowed to come near. They are not permitted to enter into the presence of God. Because God is a holy God. But what the Lord does is he gives to them, he gives to the Israelites the means. He gives the means wherein they may approach. He gives the way of approach to them. And that is the tabernacle. Remember the tent of meeting? And that is the priesthood. The priest is the one who may approach God on behalf of the people. The people may not, only the priest. You remember the tabernacle? There's an outer courtyard area. Then there's a holy place. But then there's a most holy place. The priest may go into the holy place. But when he does, in order to approach God on your behalf, he must offer blood. He must make a sacrifice first for his own sin, then for your sin, for the Israelites' sin. 
Only then may he approach God. Why is that? It's because God is holy. God is set apart. The most holy being there is pure and spotless. Any hint or stain of sin is not permitted to approach him. Now if you were to have an ambition, you want to meet the Queen. You're a young man or a young girl and you decide that before I go, I don't think I'm going to do is I'm going to meet the Queen or I'm going to meet the, the reigning monarch. Would it be possible? Would it be possible to see the reigning monarch? Well, I would suggest it would. Many ordinary people do get to see the Queen. Not just when she's um, perhaps on a visit somewhere where you can line the streets, not just when you go to London for a special occasion, but there are garden parties and such like. Or you can join certain societies and things that do have this opportunity from time to time to meet the Queen. So if it's your ambition, your goal to meet the Queen, it is feasible. It is possible. But I would suggest to you that if you were living in the days of the Old Testament, you may live a thousand lives, and yet you could never approach on your own behalf Almighty God. You cannot do it. Because God is holy. We sang last week, violent full of sin I am. God is the complete antithesis, the complete opposite. As sinful as we are, that isn't really the opposite of what God is, because God is beyond our comprehension as to his holiness, as to his beauty. Nothing, even the stain or the hint of sin, may approach him. The high priest, the high priest could go into the most holy place. That holy of holies. Remember the ordinary priest could go into the holy place and offer a sacrifice? But the high priest, he was the only one who could go into the most holy place. We might say he was the only one who could really go into the presence of God. And he could only do that once a year. And never without atonement. And never without blood. And so the Jews who were near, they had this means of approach, but it was through the priesthood. The Gentiles, as we've been seeing in chapter 2, were far. The nations were far. They didn't even have a priesthood. And that's why we must answer no. Now you'd be tactful in how you approach such a situation and you'd say, no, you, you can't come before God. But the reality is, if we take the word of God as it is at face value, you and I, on our own merits, cannot enter into God's presence. So there is an unbeliever, and he or she has this for that problem, and for me to say, well, go and take it to the Lord in prayer. It's not best advice. Because they cannot enter into God's presence with their problems because of their sin. Everyone is tainted with sin. There can only be one answer. It's there in chapter in verse 12, the first part. In him, that's Christ, in him, and through faith in him. We may approach God with freedom and with confidence in him. It's so important that we understand this. Like all these things that Paul repeats, Paul repeats it. He says, in him and through faith in him. He says, if you are in him, it is through faith in him. Faith alone in him. Let me ask you this point before we press on. Are you in him? Are you in him? Do you have faith in him? That's the most vital question, isn't it? In him, through faith in him. Nor does this mean 
That if I say I'm in him and I have faith in him, I've repented of my sin, but now look at my life now, nor does it mean that I can live freely a life of sin. Simply because I say I'm in him, I have faith in him, but I carry on with my sin. You cannot do it. You cannot carry on with your life of sin and expect that you can daily, freely approach God. You cannot do it. God is holy. He gives the means of entry. It's in him and through faith in him. But it doesn't mean to say that anyone can mock him by saying, I'm him, I have faith in him. Now, I, despite my ongoing sin and I'm happy in, I'll just enter into his presence. I'm calling my mate. We do well. We do well to stop. We do well to stop and ask ourselves, who could come before him? Our heart is a consuming fire. Who can come before him? How can I? How can I have mere word? Come before one who is pure and holy. How can I? There's only one way of access. Jesus himself said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And we often quote that verse. But the next verse is John 14, verse 6. The next verse, verse 7, goes on to say, If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. Isn't that wonderful? Through Christ, we can come to the Father. Through Christ, if we know Christ, through him, faith in him, if we know Christ, then we know the Father as well. And this word access, this word approach, it's repeated. It's repeated in Hebrews 4 and verse um, 15. Sorry, verse 16. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. Approach, it's the same word. And it's the same word as in our earlier reading in Hebrews chapter 10. It's there in verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence, now it's put confidence there, but it's that word approach, it's that word of access. Since we have access, since we have right to approach, to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is, that is his body. And since we have a great high priest, over the house of God, gain Christ. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. It's through Christ we have this great access. And the writer to Hebrews, and indeed Paul himself, would say, Use it. Draw near to Him. Seek to come near to God. It's the only way. If there was another way, if there was another means, for you and I to enter into God's presence, Christ would not have to die. He would not die from the cross. It's the only way. It's the only way. God does not do these things lightly. You come by the blood. You come by the cross. You don't come by some other way. There is no other way. Before the only way of entry into God's presence was by sacrifice. Now we can sin. Only by grace can we enter. Only by grace can we stand. Not by our human endeavour, but by the blood of the Lamb. See, it's still a sacrifice. But it's a once for all sacrifice now. It's the sacrifice of Christ, the Son of God. And through Him, Faith in Him, by grace, we can enter. We come to Him. Are we exhorted and don't many of us pray? And at the end of our prayer, say, at the end of our prayer, say, we ask this in Jesus' name, because it's Jesus' name that enables us to come before God. It's when we ask things in Jesus' name that the Father will hear us and that He will answer. Before in the Old Testament, there was a priesthood, and unless you were part of that priesthood. You had to go to them with your sacrifice for them to approach God on your behalf. Now, the Apostle Peter tells us that we, in him and through faith in him, we in Christ are a royal priesthood. We don't need anyone to go before us. 
not priests ourselves, because of the great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me ask, are you entering? Are you entering his presence? We went to names in Spain, yeah? Charter. We went to Charter, the uh, home of Sir Winston Churchill. And we were given a tour around Charter, but the man who was giving a tour at one point on an aside with someone, he said, Oh, he said, I worship Churchill. I worship him. And you could tell by the way he was speaking about it. He, he literally worshipped the man. It's good to have here, but that's going too far, isn't it? Abomination of God's But there are people who do that. There are people who, certain film stars, certain pop stars, or, or, or other famous people, just to be able to be near them, to be near them. It's just so wonderful. I don't know if you left the light out. Maybe not anymore. When we sing, All I once held dear, built my life upon, spent and worthless. Now, compared to this, knowing you. It goes on to say, Jesus knows me. But none of God. Because when we know Jesus, we know Almighty God. And so we sing, all that thrills my soul. He's not some film star. He's not so Winston Churchill, though I admire the man. It's Almighty God. And now we have this right of access. We can come with freedom and with confidence. And so we see our enter is gates with praise. You had a computer and you go on to a website, you have on your computer a, a button, a button and you have a thing you can look and it's got your history and it tells you every single time you've visited a particular website. And if you look, it's listed daily, it will tell you the last time that you visited that website. Let me ask you the question bluntly. When was the last time that you visited God? When was the last time you entered His presence? Faith in Him, or in Him, in Christ, and faith in Christ are means of access. When was the last time you sought to enter freely? With confidence, Almighty God. And how many times? How many times in the last week? I can look back over you've shown me your computer, I can look back over your history and see how many times you've been on the BBC website, for example, Facebook. How many times have you come before God? Not only that, when you actually set up a website, we have one of our um, Bradley Church website. You can actually look, there's a, a thing you can go there behind the scenes, and you can see how many people have visited your website. And you can use that in a marketing concept of business now, um, in terms of you know, trying to make your website more attractive, and, um, because what it shows is how many people have been to the home page. But then it goes on to show how many people have been to the next page, and the next page. And perhaps some more important things that you want them to learn, learn about your company, your business, that are further on in there. It tells you how many people have been with these things. And so what you learn from that is there's lots of people coming to our website initially, our advertising is doing very well, but as company director, I'm a bit concerned. Our business is not really booming here. People aren't going from the homepage any further into the website. Now turn that on its head. In the context of coming before God, how many times have you approached it? and yet not really entered into his presence. You've said your daily bit as it were. Maybe you've said a prayer of repentance. I don't know. But you've not tarried that. You've not sought to go beyond the entrance. You've not sought to go into the inner courts. You can go now into the most holy place. You can go and sit as it were in God's presence. Do you do that? Where our strength comes from. Being with Him. Being in His presence. He said it's but, but it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to do that, and I agree. Riding a bike is hard, but as you do it more and more, it gets easier, doesn't it? It should do. After you've crashed into a few cars, which I did when I was 
board. And then blame it on the person whose bike it was. It said it wasn't my bike, I've never been on it before. <laughs> and then ran away. But it does get easier. If you have to give a talk and you're nervous, it's hard at the start, but as you grow in confidence, it gets easier. Prayer often is not easy. Entering into God's presence is often not easy. We have many obstacles, many situations that try to prevent us. Our own tiredness, our own lethargy, our own cold hearts. But also, because prayer equips us, prayer is actually good for the Christian. Prayer does equip us. Because it equips us, we have an enemy. An enemy who doesn't want us to pray. An enemy who's happy for us to look at the building, as it were, even to step in the gate a little bit. As long as we come back out again quickly, we have an enemy. He will try to put every obstacle in the way of our heart. I found it yesterday, I confessed it, such in prayer. I found it yesterday in the constant prayer for revival. There were people praying, and I'm thinking about what I'm going to have for dinner later. I couldn't concentrate. Hard to focus. When I pray, what am I saying? It's such a struggle to pray. Sometimes it's very hard. We have our own doubts, our own fears, our own sin that entangles us and causes problems for us. The old nature lies in us saying, go and do something, go to the beach. I need something more pleasurable. The lust of the world. I'm a creepy one. Thursday at our prayer meeting, we looked at Epaphras. We looked at Epaphras. We looked at one thing that Epaphras did. And Epaphras in Colossians 4.12, Paul informed us that Epaphras was praying. Praying for the church, the Colossian church. We didn't just say he prays for you every day. He used the word wrestle. He wrestles in prayer. And prayer is often like a wrestling. Often it's like a battle. I've got to battle through my own lethargy. I've got to battle to get the devil off my back. And I've got to battle to get my eyes off the things that are not good for me. To get my eyes on Christ. So much so that one writer says, the best thing to do is to preach to yourself. Mm -hmm. To preach to yourself. There you are, you're looking to come into the presence of God. You've thought about how holy he is. You've thought about what a worm I am. You've asked yourself, you never made such a one as I am. And then the devil comes and floods and reminds you of some of your sin. What do you do? You preach yourself. You start by saying, of the devil, he doesn't know the whole of me. He's not omniscient. God knows even more of my sin. How vile I am. You remind yourself of your sin. Not so that you get depressed and downcast and give up. But so you can give all the more glory to him because you don't want to preach to yourself, to remind yourself of Christ and of his cross, of his crucifixion, of his dying shame upon that cross, so that all that sin, Tim prayed in his prayer, he died for all that sin. All that sin. Jesus. And you in preaching to yourself, you remind yourself, you lay it upon him, and that is what you do, you lay it upon him, even there on your knees. You leave it with him, you give it to him. You repent of it. You bear it with him. And you praise him and you thank him for what he's done. And you take your time. Tarrying in his presence. Just going over these things. Some of the great truths of what Christ has done. Thanking God and praising God and worshipping him. For looking down on the world as you do. Doing this. And you ask him. You ask him to aid you. You ask him to aid you as you pray. You ask him to fill you with his Holy Spirit and to give you a focus and a mindset wherein you can truly focus and tarry before him, entering into his courts with praise. He went up in a light aircraft on a cloudy day. What you find on this particular day as you're going up is that it gets worse. What was 
water, in the, in the drizzle on the ground is torrential rain, you're in the thick of this cloud. And not only that, but your little aircraft is getting battered all over the place. It's going upwards, but it's really hard. And you think, wouldn't it be better to just go back down? Perhaps today is not a good day for flying. Perhaps today is better for going and standing on good old terracotta, not terracotta, but terracotta. Terracotta is a play, isn't it? That's the same thing. Terracotta. But you don't. You point the nose upwards and you keep going up through the clouds and though it gets thicker and wetter and perhaps colder, and the plane, flat rain, the plane is shaking all the more. It's a begins to break through. It begins to break through through in the cloud. And what you begin to see is blue sky. Blue sky all around and blue sky up above. And before you know it, you look down. You have freedom. Freedom because down below is all the cloud, is all the darkness, is all the young. Now up where you are, well, no longer now is it a light aircraft. You're in a supersonic jet and you're soaring, winging your way to heaven. Blue sky all around you. That's how it should be. That's how it can be. That's how it often is for the Christian. Boldness. Freedom. Approaching him with confidence. Tarrying through all that traffic, through all that cloud, through all that drizzle. Pointing the nose upwards, praising God, even though you don't feel like you want to praise. Praising Him until you begin to feel it. Because you begin to sense His warmth, you begin to sense His presence descending upon you. When was the last time? When was the last time you were right? When was the last time you prayed like that? Do we experience that kind of prayer? Times that been your experience. If you read some of the headwriters in the hymn book, you get the impression because they're experiencing an awful lot. It's their fault. It's their fault. Ultimately, Paul is building on what is said in chapter 1, verse 17 to 19. He started off with a prayer. He's prayed that we may know him better, a spirit of wisdom and revelation, heart knowledge. Remember? We have this heart knowledge of him. He then went on in verse 18 to say that we have this, his prayer is that we have this spiritual sight. The eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Then he goes on to speak about the hope to which he has called you. We may know this hope more and more. Then he goes on to talk about his incomparably great power to the believer. Then if you remember, he describes to the end of the chapter that power of work in raising Christ and seating Christ at the right hand of the Father and now given all power and dominion. Then in chapter 2, having laid out the fact that we are dead, he gives a demonstration of that power that worked in Christ, working in you to bring you to life. And then he brings a demonstration of the knowledge of the wisdom of God in bringing the Jew and Gentile together in this glorious way, in this glorious oneness in Christ. What is his ultimate purpose in all of this? And why the digression? It's to bring us to this point, that in Christ and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and with confidence. That is what we must do. That is what doctrine needs to do. That is what we can do. Are we doing it? Are we doing it? The whole purpose of redemption is that we may enter into God's presence. In Christ, we may enter now through faith. Then one day, faith will be taken away. Christ will be visible. No more will we be a visitor. A matter of saying, visitors love you. Belong. You belong. Now, if you're a stranger now, you'll be a stranger then. The time to be 
reconciled. The time to be welcomed is now, to enter into his gates now in him, through faith in him. That is the answer, that is the response. You and I, I believe we have a biblical mandate to say, I can pray for you, of an unbeliever. But we don't have a biblical mandate to say, you go and pray. Without we point them to Christ and say, he is the way, he is the only way. Stranger now, you'll be a stranger then. But if you're welcome now, you won't just be welcome now. You will live there. If you're hungry, someone says, go to the table. There's food and plenty. You're hungry. Don't eat. Have a fill. If you're thirsty, someone says, look, there's a glass, there's a tap. Come and get yourself a drink. Satisfy your thirst. If you're cold and it's a large room, has a roaring fire, someone said, come on, come near to the fire, warm yourself by the fire. Whatever we need, whatever we need, Paul says, my God will meet all your needs according to his riches, his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. In him, through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and with confidence. Whatever your need in Christ, come to God. Draw near to God, and He will draw near.